morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. It's, it's good to see some new faces here. Amen. And it's good to see some other faces here, too. That's a pretty good save. Yeah. Brother Ellis is with us here this morning. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you for your willingness to share from the pulpit here this morning. There's a couple of announcements. Uh, the basket outside for the Travis teachers will be going there tomorrow, hopefully, for them Tuesday as they enter into some, some uh, testing time. But it's just a few snacks where they won't have to worry about what they're going to do in between time. Thank you, everyone that has given there. appreciate it. Once again, there's a fireman's basket outside for the volunteer fire department if uh, you felt in the direction to give along those lines. We still have wind and it's still dry and we're still going to have fire. Yeah. I'm anxious to get started this morning. Uh, we've got, look like quite a few ladies here that probably have children. So happy Mother's Day to each and every one of them. Uh, there'll be a little something special a little bit later on in the service as uh, we start. If you would, let me lead you in, in prayer. And then Emily is here. After all that working out with the shot put and uh, the, the relay stuff, she's probably tired, but she'll be leading us in our pledges this morning. Thank you, Emily. Father, as we gather here this morning, Father, it's for us to worship to have fellowship with each other, but Father, to have fellowship with you. And Father, as we acknowledge all of our mothers here today, Father, none of us would be here if it wasn't for you or if it wasn't for our mothers. So Father, bless this time that we have here today. Father, bless your word through Brother Ellis here as, as, as he stands in the pulpit to share. And Father, once again, I, I, I do pray for Hyde. And Father, it is my hope that we all are praying for Hyde. Mm -hmm. Father, for the future. Father, as we pray that you rise up that one that you want standing in this pulpit to lead this church into the days to come. But Father, help us all make good decisions. And Father, help us come before you with all of our decisions. Father, bless this time that we have here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Ms. Emma, would you please lead us in our place? If one ever want to please stand, please. Stand corrected once again. 
Jesus will be passed out. Yes. Okay, let's start with our youngest mother. If uh, you're a mother and you're 35 years old, raise your hand. Or under. Under 35. If you're under 35,
moment.
and uh, if you've not had an opportunity yet to drop uh, offering him a play, please uh, feel free just to step out during the song and, and the play for back here at the back and do it. And let me pray with you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. Father, and worship you with our tithes and offerings. And Father, I pray that as, as we sing, Father, and we come before you, Father, that uh, we would realize this is a time of worship. And Father, that you would bless. And we'd ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
now. Father, we just slip that to you. That, Father, we forget about everything else right now. Father, we, we come before you. And Father, nothing else is on our minds but you and what you have us to do. Father, I thank you. Thank you for this time. Lord, now I lift Brother Ellis to you as he comes to share with us this morning. Father, I pray you would speak through him and Father, that he would deliver that work you have for us in this very time and this very circumstance. And Father, I just pray and again that you would speak through him and use it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Ellis. Get turned on here. I was preaching to Howard with last Sunday, and the sound man hooked me up with a lapel mic. I got through preaching. The sound man told me I forgot to turn the mic on. <laughs> that reminds me. I was thinking there, sitting there a minute ago, we we'll think about all the modern conveniences we have these days. I first pastored at Sam uh, Hollis, Oklahoma, out in the country, about 15 miles, out in the Sand Hills. And I don't think we had a sound system. And in the fall of the year, it got to get cool, there'd be clumps of walls on the ceiling. And we had about two or three big old Dearborn heaters. And one of the deacons would come by early on Sunday morning and light those up. And about the time I began to preach, those walls would begin to move. <laughs> and one, one Sunday morning I was preaching and, and my wife sitting on about second or third seat. And she screamed out, you got a wasp in your hair. <laughs> Things have changed a whole lot since those days. If I look at you and you talk to me and I act like I don't hear you, I probably didn't. I forgot to put my hearing aids in this morning. But uh, maybe we'll get by today. <coughs> Theo came by and sat with me a little bit ago. I was pastor at San Norman Baptist Church back in about 1966. His granddad and grandmother were members there. His granddad was a deacon there. Keo, he comes from good stock. His grandmother was blind. And they would invite his wife and I and kids down for, for dinner sometimes. And I was amazed at how, how his grandmother could function blind. And, but my wife would want to help her with the dishes and she wouldn't let her because she said, if I do and you put them up, I can't find them. <laughs> and that's kind of like it is. I've got two daughter-in-laws that when they come and they just take over in the kitchen and that's great. But when they leave, I spend about a month looking for, for things. But uh, open your Bibles in Colossians. <clears throat> chapter verse 18 through 19 at the moment. I have a, a, a poem that I want to dedicate to the mother this morning. Uh, if there's anyone in this world that needs a special day for them, it's our mothers. I was raised on a farm in East Oklahoma. 
we moved to Georgia in 1939 from Gainesville, Georgia to Chicago, Oklahoma. In 1939, I was five years old. <clears throat> and I remember we sure cropped the first year we was there. And then we started farming on them. My dad bought a lamp and we were farming on our own. And uh, I remember in World War II, and I was just a little fellow, probably seven or eight years old, and we went to church at a little schoolhouse that had a church, Sunday school church every Sunday. In fact, my, some of my first preaching I did there, fourth Sunday was my Sunday, they had a different type of preacher every Sunday, and we drove down to Tulsa to Dakota, and I preached there, <clears throat> and I remember those, those days, and nearly every one of the older people in, in that in that Sunday school church had a, a young man in, in the armed service of World War II. And, and uh, I can remember them getting up and having prayer meetings and, 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 and crying. Those, uh, our people would cry and beg God for the safety of their people in the military. Some of the best memories of my childhood was in Sunday school. And, and there at a little community called Central Life. But mothers, I'm gonna I'm gonna dedicate this poem to you this morning. I've used it a lot of times. It said seems like it says something to me. It's the title of just the bravest battle. The bravest battle that ever was fought, shall I tell you where and when? On the maps of the world, you'll find it not. It was fought by the mothers of men. Nay not with cannon or battle shot with sword or no repent, nay, not with eloquent words or thoughts, but mouths of wonderful men. But deep in a walnut woman's heart, the woman who would not yield, but bravely, silently bore her part, lo, oh, there was a battlefield. No marshalling troops, no bivouac song, no banner to gleam and wave, but all oh, these battles, they last alone from babyhood to the grave. Yet faithful still as a bridge of stars, she fights in her walled up town, fights on and on in her endless wars, then silent and unseen goes down. O oh, you with banner and battle shot, with soldiers to shout and praise, I tell you the kingless victories wrought are won in these silent ways. O oh, spotless woman in a world of shame, with splendor and silent storm, go back to God as pure as you can, the queenless warrior born. <coughs> I don't know about you, but on Mother's Day it gets me started thinking. I've had some experience with mothers, my mother. I never spent much time with my grandmother because they were from Georgia and we didn't get to go back uh, in those days. But my mother, I can remember her. I remember us hoeing cotton. And she'd hoe cotton until about 11 o'clock in the morning. Then she'd go home on a wood stove and cook our dinner and get it ready. And we'd come in and eat lunch. And about 1.30, She'd come back to the field and hold with us until supper time. She'd go home and cook supper. We milk a bunch of cows, and then we'd go out and milk the cows, and she was involved in all that. I remember my mother and my dad both working, working so hard to make a living for, for the family. And but mother always seemed to, to take us to church and and I can remember her praying. Then I, after I married Tula, my wife, her mother, they, she was raised on a farm also, and I remember her mother and dad. And, and uh, it was my privilege to preach my mother-in-law's funeral. And I loved her about like I loved my mother. She was a wonderful woman. Mothers, I salute you today. You know, I was thinking about that and I kind of prepared a message for today and I thought about some of the things. You know, mothers are chauffeurs, 
cooks, doctors, nurses, de decorators. Counselors, you get on and on about the, the hats that the mothers wear that they do. And I can look back at my life and wonder what would happen to me if my mother hadn't been like she was. She prayed for us and always looking forward to. to she was. Always act like she was proud. My brother, older brother, was a preacher, pastor for a lot of years. <coughs> so I lost my wife in February of this year, and she was always the one that I could watch during the service and know when I goofed up. And I remember one Sunday morning, the first church I pastored, I'd been there a little while. We got in the car and started home. My wife said, honey, I preached on that kid that morning. She said, honey, I don't know really what you were trying to say this morning, but said you had Nicodemus up a tree all day. <laughs> and you know, not one other soul ever mentioned that to me but her. And so we, we miss, miss our, our wives and our mothers when they're gone from us. In Colossians, I want to read a couple of scriptures, then we'll go to Proverbs, and then just talk a little bit about mothers this morning. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. Husband, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Then uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and even the Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wife be to her own husband in everything. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, we have a great duty to love our wives who most of our wives are mothers. And notice that first verse that I read out of that uh, in the 21st verse says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You know, when I, I preach on submission of wives to husbands, the husbands are always that. But then when I, I read this part where it says, Husband, love your wives. The wife gets her turn. Yeah. And, but this scripture says, submitting yourselves one to another. And I believe that's the way we need to live together as husband and wife, that we submit to one another. Simply saying that we need to give over and be willing to, to give over. And uh, I notice in John, the 19th chapter, if you remember when Jesus was on the cross, just before he died, he looked out there and he saw his mother standing by John, his beloved disciple. And Jesus said to John, Behold thy mother. And he said to his mother, Behold thy son. Talk about John. He was committing the care of his mother to the responsibility of looking after her to John. Jesus loved the mothers. Jesus loved everyone. He had a special love for women who were mothers. And, and it showed that. You know, I was thinking about
I get things about my mother, my wife's mother, and even my grandparents that I knew when I was a little boy. <clears throat> Think about how they loved and cared for me, and, and I know that your mother's in the same, same way. And I remember that after I was grown and married and lived several miles from my folks, you didn't get to see them nearly as much as I would have liked to have. My father, I'd come to pastor the First Baptist Church before, 1987. We moved into the parsonage on the week before Easter. And the next Sunday, on Easter Sunday, the church burned, if you remember. Make the question your calling. <laughs> But everything worked fine. We we got built back on the church and we moved into our church building and paid forward and had a big church payment and, and Lord blessed and but when I went to that church they I asked that I'd have a few days to go visit my parents. They were getting old and dad and her getting getting very fragile and and so when we got the contract met and everything on the church, well the deacon said it's time for you to go see your folks. And, and my wife wasn't feeling real well and didn't want to go and, and that time. And I got to go with myself. I almost didn't go. I messed around about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was about a five and a half hour drive. and finally left and drive. My sister lived about two blocks from the nursing center where they were in. And I stayed with her at night and, and uh, visited them all in the day and I stayed till Friday. And I came home on Friday. Monday morning following, they were coming to tear down the old building to get to build a new building. And I was out taking the fire tape down around the building. Parsons across the street from the church. And my wife called me, said you need to come to the house and told me that my father had just gone to sleep and didn't wake up that morning. And I've always wondered and I felt glad that I went and spent that time with them and with my mother. I want to read in, in the third verse. You, you're familiar probably with this, this scripture, the third first chapter of Proverbs. It, it's uh, the first nine verses is, is that a woman gives, mother gives advice to her son. We won't read that part of it, but I'm going to start reading with about the 10th verse and read that and just make a few comments about it this morning. <clears throat> Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks the wool of flax and works willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises up also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. She considers the field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengthen her arm. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She lays her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold this that. Talk about a spinning wheel, I suppose. She stretched out her hands to the poor. Yea, she reached out forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, for her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gate, or in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. 
She made the fine linen and sellet it and delivered the girdles to the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the way of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excelleth in all. Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. In our world today, I can remember in growing up that I can remember my parents teaching us kids to be respectful of, of people that are older than we are. Our landlord on one farm was Mr. Homer Davidson, a very godly man. And but people called him I I thought he was terribly old and he hadn't been dead that many years. But I remember that some people, they call him Old Man Davidson. Really not a slam, but but you know, if you remember probably you growing up, you pick up some some of those things. And I remember we was eating at the table a meal, and I don't remember the occasion, but I used the term Old Man Davidson, and, and I got real close to getting a real good spanking for for that. Times have changed a lot in our day, Amen. but. Back in those days, certainly men stood when women came in. They took off their hats when women came in. People respected mothers. And that's somewhat has changed. Isn't it really an encouragement when some young person opens the door for you or says, excuse me, or shows? But this woman that we're talking about here is a woman that he says she's not lazy. She takes care of her home and household. I believe that God wants us, not only mothers, but every one of us, to not be lazy, but go about our business in, in a way that we're not lazy. And, and we'll go beyond what we have to do and that shows we're not lazy. Another thing I noticed in reading this scriptures is that she was very frugal with money. In total of my marriage, total was always a lot better with money than I was. And she was a, she was a financer, but she handled the finance of our company and uh, and the Ellis company. And uh, uh, I remember my mother. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, and my mother was she took care of the money, and, and uh, Dad worked construction, worked out of town some, and he draw some of his check to live on out of town. But also she handled. The money, but I remember going to my mother and and and, and I need some money. And, and when you went to my mother and got money, all the time she was digging her purse or her billfold, she would give you a lecture about you know how bad off we were. And then she'd come out with a twenty dollar bill or a ten dollar bill or something. But she took care of finances, and it seemed like this lady we're talking about here took care of her finances. She even it talks about the merchant ships and things and she not only dealt locally but she dealt and, and to make a living for her family. And it seems to me as I read this that she had a love for her children. Let me just stop here and say something. 
I may get in trouble for it, but I've been there before. <laughs> I don't understand how people can kill a little child. I don't understand. That's beyond me to comprehend that. But I've seen, I've seen mothers stay up all night with sick children, sit at the hospital for night after night with sick children. You know, when God come, created mothers, he created, I think, someone with a bigger compassion for love than, than the ordinary person. And, you know, I've noticed something about, uh, about the female species. Not only in, in <coughs> human beings, but in, in animals. <coughs> the female species is just more vicious when it comes to protecting the young. You really want to get the battle on them, you just mistreat mama's kids. That works pretty well in the animal kingdom, too, if you notice. I don't know what there is about the creation when God took the rib of Adam and made Eve. And, and, but uh, also, I noticed that she lives and, and conducts her life in such a way that her husband praises her. Husband, let me stop now and say a word to you about something. You know, I've preached and taught all my ministry, I guess, that we need to love our wives and tell them that we love them. And, and uh, I think Tula and I did that uh, to a certain extent. But, you know, if you're not real careful, you can't kind of get like the old gentleman that his wife said, honey, said, you just don't tell me you love me anymore. He said, well, honey, so I told you when we were married, I hadn't changed my mind. Sometimes we men operate on that kind of theory. Guys, the last biggest snow we had, my wife and I, she was like I got to be an invalid. Her mind was sharp, but she just couldn't walk. Couldn't, couldn't. And I took care of her about the last year and a half of her life. And uh, she took care of me 60 plus years. And, and uh, yeah. I, I don't regret a minute of that. But we sat, we visited, I, I don't know, it seemed to me like that day especially, I guess it was bad, it was we couldn't get out. And, and we visited uh, that day, just about this and that and the other, and just had a good time. And, and when the evening came, and, and it's hard, she didn't have much of an appetite, and, and it's kind of hard to get something that she'd like. And, and uh, we talked about what we were going to eat for supper or dinner, if you want to call it that. Uh, and I'd gone into the kitchen to, to cook it. And a little bit, when I was almost through, I heard her coughing a little bit, and I left the kitchen and walked in and to the dining room, to the dining room, and she was in a lift chair in the living room, and, and I said, do you need a, a bottle of water? And she shook her head no. And I walked on around where I could confront where I see and I saw she was in trouble. I called her ambulance. The ambulance came in about seven or eight minutes. And before they got there, I couldn't get a pulse or a, pulse or a heartbeat. And that quickly, she was gone. Husbands, when that happens, you lose all opportunity to tell your love when you love them. I think she knew that for sure. But I get to looking back and get to thinking about the times I could have, could have told her that and didn't. And I can't explain to you how, if you went through this, you, you know what I feel, but uh, I find myself sometimes wanting to ask her something and then suddenly know that she's not there anymore and never will be there anymore. She's in heaven, and I don't want her back in the condition she's in to come back in and, and, and her life and have to go through what she did during the last couple of years. But we need to tell our wives and show them our love for them. 
But this thing that this father, this, her husband or her father, uh, seemed like that, that he must have done that. But not all of that, but this mother will live her life in such a way that that her husband would be proud of her when it says when he said at the gate. And back when this was written, a lot of community things went on at the gate. The, the leaders of the community gathered at the gate and, and, and there he could be looked up to because of his wife. And I, I really bothers me when I hear a husband or wife uh, putting their husband or wife down in public or making fun and things. Uh, people we, we certainly need to, to love our, our and, and you know I, I know them. how many ever go, go into your kitchen or bedroom or something and stop wondering why in the world you're there? Kind of reminds me of the old couple of sitting watching TV, TV one night and, and, and she said, Paul, how would you like to have a, a good bowl of ice cream? He said, that sounds real good. She was gone and gone and gone and a little bit she came back and she had two plates, a hamburger on each plate. <laughs> Handed him his hamburger. He took the top off of it and looked at it and said, just like I thought, she left off the mustard. So that's kind of how it is. But, you know, I look back and I, and I see, and I know you do the same thing sometimes. Look back and when, when we were younger and our kids were involved in sports and we were going in every direction trying to keep up with them and, and, and things of that nature. And I see this woman, she's very uh, inventive. She, she makes things and she does things for her family and a mother's responsibility and, and uh, many cases that I've run into in the ministry is the mother is the leader, the religious leader of the home as well. Mothers have a, a great responsibility. And I look at this, at this woman talks about her kindness. Mothers are kind. I remember our mother and our family, there's five of us. I had two brothers and two sisters. I'm the only one left out of that family. My wife was, was one of 17 brothers and sisters and half brothers and sisters. You imagine that. And she's her sister now, the only one left out of that group. But I, I can remember my mother and, and, and her kindness as, and as she took care of the things of the house. And, and, and I look back and, and I don't know how many of you ever watched the uh, wagon train or some of those shows where they have covered wagons. And, and, uh, uh, but life has not always been easy for mothers. Uh, I can remember that we didn't we didn't own an automobile until I think I was in seventh grade, and we went in two horse wagon, and all the inconveniences of those days. And, but how that my mother, and not only her but the mothers of that area, that uh, and that part of the country that that did a, that had to work hard in order to take care of their families. Mothers are to be treasured, to be loved, looked up to. I've not wanted many mothers that would not give their life for their child. I was watching the other night, I don't know where any of you are not, there used to be a uh, Program on home emergencies, two paramedics working with the fire department, and they run into all kinds of situations in, that, in, in the show. <clears throat> and I was watching that the other night, and, and this young woman <clears throat> was hurt, I believe, in an accident, and she respected a child. And she was, went, they came to her, 
and it looked like it might come down to the choice of saving her or the child. And when they asked her that question, she said, was very adamant that if it come down to her, that it, they had to make a choice and that, that they would save her child. She was willing to, to lose her life in order to protect her child. Mm -hmm. That's when you're looking at real love. Not only expressed, but completed in their life. How many of you remember the way back there, the astral, I think it was, commercial, and showed this little boy and knocked on the door, and the mother came to the door, and, and he asked about his little friend that he played with. And she said, uh, he's, uh, he's not feeling well. I've given him aspirin, and he's laying down to rest. And this little boy replied, said, mothers are like that. Mothers are like that. Now the question might come to you, and I'm trying to watch the clock back there. I preached at the Hope Baptist Church several times a while back, and, and before they got their last pastor. And they have a big, big round clock sitting right there in the seat, just looking right at it. <laughs> I went to Panhandle to Calvary Baptist Church to preach, and they had a big clock over there, but it was stopped. And I asked them if they didn't think that was a little bit dangerous. And the preacher was full pit with a stop clock sitting there. But now let's ask ourselves a question. What makes mothers like this? What makes this particular mother like she was? It was because she knew God. It's because she worshiped God. And it's because she used God's precepts and, and his teaching in her life as she lived it. People, I want to share with you that I, I'm convinced that, that our testimony in living, as we live it, is more forceful and more power than our verbal witness. Because, my dear friend, if I stand here and tell you how religious I am and how, how my witness is and I say all this and claim love to God, then I go out and I don't live it out there in the community where I live. Don't ever think for a minute people don't know about your life. Because they do. I don't know how many times I've gone out to witness to, to people and, and and they begin to compare themselves with somebody else. And they say something like this, well, preacher, I know so-and-so in your church, and I'm just as good as they are. And people, the only answer I've ever found for that is simply to say, well, you may know them better than I do. But let me share one other thing with you. When I stand before God in judgment, and I will, you're either going to stand before the great white throne judgment or you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And either way, when we stand before the judgment, he's not going to ask me about the Bible. Mm -hmm. He's not going to ask me about this. He's going to ask me about Lewis Ellis. Lewis Ellis is going to answer for himself of what I've done with Jesus and how I've either accepted or rejected him and how the scripture says in 2 Corinthians, for any man that has Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. We need to act like things become new in our life if we claim Christianity and we claim salvation. We need to live that in our lives when we deal with people. And you know, I've noticed that people seem shocked sometimes about when you do things like that. A while back, I run by United one day to get lunch for Tool and I, and and I I, I got to I got my plate off the off the deal there, but she wanted a sandwich, so I ordered a sandwich. They had to make the sandwich. Well, they gathered up stuff and put it in, in the box and brought it out there, and I, and I gave them a, a huge debit card. It said to be so much. I didn't pay any attention. I just did that and a little bit to have the sandwich <coughs> and 
put it in the bag with the other, and I went home, and after I got home, I got to think about that. that wasn't very much for two lunches. And I got to look at the chicken, <coughs> and they had never charged me for the sandwich. So I think this was on the weekend, I, Monday, I went out to go town or something, and I, I went by, and the little girl would know what I wanted. I told her I saw it in here, I think it was Saturday or Sunday. And, and, and y'all failed to charge me. And, and she acted like she was shocked. That, uh, that's kind of bad. You know that when people are shocked when you try to do the right thing? The people we need to, we need to live out as we live. And, and I know sometimes decisions are hard, but we need, to, we need to make those decisions that we can be a witness not only in our verbal talking, but we need to be a witness in our living as we live with our fellow citizens in our community where we are in our church or wherever it happens to be in school or wherever. But this lady here that it talks about, it talks about her honor and her dignity and it talks about she didn't, didn't use her tongue for idle talk and, and, and there have been more people hurt by gossip and idle talk but this mother here, and the reason that all this we read about her, the reason it happened in her life was because she knew God. I'd say to us today, it's because we know Christ. He ought to make a change in our life. I don't have any answer why people will profess Christ as a Savior and then, then go out and live like they don't know Him. But that's one thing that they'll ask not to me, but to God. Mother, I salute you today. I wouldn't trade places for you, but I've learned a lot. I, I've learned a lot of what my wife done, because now that I'm the only one in the home, and I'm, if I get a meal, I either cook it or buy it. And, and my wife was a tremendous cook. She was a tremendous seamstress. Uh, she had the talent in our family. And, and but we need to enjoy and really appreciate our mothers and our wives and then we ought to treat them with kindness and with love and respect. And I thank you for the privilege of speaking today, especially on this Mother's Day. I would, I would encourage you to read that 31st chapter of Proverbs and really study on it a little bit and see what, what that's all about. Let it speak to us. There's only two places to go and one way to get there. There's heaven and hell. We don't preach on hell much anymore, do we? I was at a church about 10 years ago and preached a sermon on hell. And uh, uh, one of the deacons came up to me at the service and said that we had not heard a sermon like that in 10 years. Uh, I couldn't believe that in 10 years some, some pastor hadn't, hadn't told them that there's a place called hell and a place to shun and a place to go was to heaven. And there's only two places to go and one way to get to our Jesus said, I'm the way, the life, the truth, and no one will come to me except to God, except through Him. Yeah. Doesn't make sure how good we are. Doesn't make sure how good this lady was we're talking about here. But she had she had to believe in God and believe in Christ. And that day probably in that written, it was God on the old covenant. But you and I, the only way we're going to get to heaven is by accepting Jesus Christ and place our faith and trust in Him. And there's not going to be any exceptions. They won't be anybody slipping by. And you know, I, I've got some beautiful granddaughters and grandsons, great grandsons, great daughters, granddaughters. And, and you know, I think sometimes we're not careful we get lax about trying to win them to, to the war. Because I don't care how sweet and adorable they are, it's going to come a time when the question is going to be what you've done with Jesus. Jesus loves mothers. 
you follow his thing. And you notice the very last one of the last things he did on the cross was make sure his mother was taken care of. Mother is something special. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for our mothers and we can look back and see what all they did and uh, how unselfish they were and if they're loving us and taking care of us as children and all that they did and, and do for us through our lives. We thank you for the mothers that are here today. We pray that you bless their lives and bless their homes. We pray that you bless this church as they go about looking for a pastor to lead. Heavenly Father, that you just lead and guide and direct them, never step away. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work and the concern of this church for the community in which they live. Lord, we pray today that the one here that does not know you, that they might come to put your faith and trust in you and know your blessing. That you go with us throughout this coming week. Put somebody in our way that we might tell them about Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother, would you stand with us as we sing the hymn of invitation? Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.